Okay, good morning. Thank you all for coming. You're in the right place. You are in the house of King Jesus. And we are to assemble together. And more so, it says when we see things happening. Well, don't you see things happening at a rapid rate? And I can't think of a better place for God's people to be than uh, in an assembly together in worship and in prayer and doing the church work that the Bible has declared unto us. And I have a few things to share with you uh, at the beginning here. One that my wife shared with me this morning on the way in that I found rather uh, surprising for a number of reasons. And it's about what happened in Boise, Idaho. Some of you may be aware of it. Man in custody, it says, and this is CNN News. Man in custody after nine injured in mass stabbing in Idaho apartment complex. Now, it says, uh, this is again from Boise, Idaho. A man is in custody after a stabbing that left nine people injured at an, an apartment complex. Now, I want you to notice the key word here is a man in custody after a stabbing that left nine people injured. Mainly, what type of people stab people? You said Mexicans, Latinos also, Muslims, blacks. And, I mean, occasionally you'll hear about two white guys getting in a strap at a bar or something like that, and there'll be a stabbing. But that 97 or more percent of the cases are from Muslims or Mexicans. And it goes on to say, again, this happened in an apartment complex that houses refugee families in Boise, Idaho, authorities say. Uh, victims injured in the stabbing Saturday night included members of Boise Refugee Committee, Community, Police Chief William Bone said, and he declined to provide additional details on the victims or who this person is. And so I'm asking you to think who might be responsible for these stabbings. I'm not talking about these stabbings in a sad way, meaning as a lot of people would think. I'm not happy that anybody is stabbed. I'm just saying this is a natural consequence of multiculturalism. It's a natural con uh, consequence and happening because you let the dark, we have let the dark races come into our nation here. And as you said, well, it's probably Mexicans or it could be a Muslim. It could be a Muslim uh, attacking. This isn't a white person uh, doing the attacking against the Muslims. If it was, they would have said. Yeah, if it was, they would have probably right away said that. So all I want to do is make, this, make you aware of this. This is uh, interesting on a number of levels. They kill their own? And, uh, well, yeah, they kill their own. They'll, they'll kill their own for violating their law or whatever. Um, here's probably an even more interesting um, email that was sent out by a man that's starting to wake up, a white man that is starting to wake up. He doesn't... He what? He runs an organization called uh, Take America Back. He runs an organization called Take America Back. So if you want to look it up, you can. Uh, and it's called White Waking Up. White Waking Up. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I did want to read the beginning part to you because I found this extremely uh, interesting. Quote, to take America back, I can't help but wonder why the left is attacking white people all the time. 
Have you noticed this? Why are they trying to make white people feel guilty? I'm white, and I'm not ashamed of it. Why should I be? Have you noticed all the TV commercials with interracial couples? What's up with that big question mark? Now, again, there's more to this, but hey, at least this white person is starting to wake up and ask questions and is noticing what we've been noticing all along, that they're bringing these interracial couples and pushing that, inter- of course, they're pushing the homosexual in general. That, but uh, more and more commercials, uh, I've noticed Tide is doing this a lot, um, pushing a, a white man married to a black woman or vice versa. A lot of, a lot of these uh, industries today are pushing that agenda, and the, and the media is only too happy to promote that. And whites and Asians, too, also. Okay, now here's, here's my favorite. I'll just show it to you. I printed it out this morning. I can't wait to read this to you. <laughs> Dear Blacks, if you find whites coming to your shacks to rob, rape, or murder you, or you find whites burning down your schools, buses, or trains, or stoning your cars and defacing your statues, you are most welcome to be racist, sincerely, whites. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that really says it all. i got to read it again. Dear Blacks, if you find whites coming to your shacks to rob, rape, or murder you, or you find whites burning down your schools, buses, or trains, or stoning your cars and defacing your statues, you are most welcome to be racist. Signed, sincerely, whites. Folks, I'd say there's an awakening happening. White people are starting to wake up. More and more of them are starting to wake up, and they're looking to align themselves or find like-minded people. They're looking for answers. Well, we have answers. We have the true answer, which is the Word of God. Not what we think, well, not what we feel, not based on uh, fake evidence, not based on fake news or fake history, but real history, Bible history. We're, this is based on the word of our King, King Jesus Christ. We have the truth for them, and we, we need to get that truth into their hands. We've got to find them. We've got to seek them out. They're there, and we need to pray, God provide these people and provide the truth for them. Let's tired of being correct. Yes, they're getting tired of being politically correct. Let's pray. Let's pray about this right now. Lord Jesus, uh, we come to you as your church, and we come to you in, in this need, a need that we see happening out there. Our people are waking up, and we want to be able to provide responses to them. We want to provide your word of truth to them. We want to do other things that you called us to do as your church and to bring about uh, essential uh, message, the kingdom message, the essentials of your kingdom unto them. Help us Provide a way. Give us light. We need your light. We need your guidance. We need your uh, help in, in this matter. But if you will provide us the light, if you will open the door for us, uh, give us strength to walk in and do what is necessary and essential to bring about kingdom truth unto your people and shine the light so they can come out of this darkness of Babylon that is, uh, ha- they've been surrounded by. Set us free. Set your people free. Only in you, Jesus, can we find true freedom and liberty. 
Amen and amen. Okay, we're going to continue where we left off last week. Foundation Reality, um, Part 2. Foundation Reality, Part 2. I would have you turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We will begin reading in verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. Quote, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Would you not say, especially according to the message that we delivered last week on this very subject matter about the foundation and Jesus Christ being the, the only real foundation, that this is essential understanding for us to have. Amen? It's essential understanding. We ought to hear a loud amen from everybody in here because this is something to get excited about. If you're going to get excited about anything, this is really something to get excited about. And we need to move and do our best to pray, seek God's Word, seek the leading of the Holy Spirit to move in the direction or get in contact with this biblical foundation, which is Christ. Let's pray right now again. Lord Jesus, we pray for your people according to your covenant, meaning your contract, your, the contract and covenant that you have given your people that is expressed throughout your word, your divine purposes, your spiritual inspiration and direction, your Holy Spirit leading and calling. Amen. The Bible tells us that the true church was founded by Jesus Christ. It is a biblical and foundational reality. It's a reality that we must understand and that we must seek, and we must uphold its precepts. The Bible says, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. The church of Israel is to be under the order and jurisdiction of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And I think we need to, again, quit being led around and distracted and divided by every whim of doctrine, especially concerning who the Lord Jesus Christ is. The Bible says... He is the creator of all things. Are there more than one creator? No, there's only one Lord, one baptism. And there's only really one church, the church of Israel. And we need to understand why Christ came, what he is doing with regard to his church. Is his church a multiracial, multicultural, universal church that we are to bring all the races of the world in and pollute and mingle ourselves with? Because that's what the Judeo Christian church is doing. Then we have to ask ourselves if that's wrong. If it's biblically wrong, and it is biblically wrong, well, we've showed message after message that this is wrong and the reasons why, then we need to separate ourselves from that false church. We need to separate ourselves from denominationalism. The traditions of man is really what is destroying us today because the traditions of man are feeding God's people deception and, and uh, false truths and half-truths. Again, if you present a half-truth, it is still even more dangerous than a total lie. Because they are mixing 
uh, tr- uh, false things, false ideas, false concept, worldly ideas, worldly traditions, false church traditions, everything that you can imagine concerning the world. And that is a part of worldly thought and worldly reasoning and the carnal mind. It's all impacted right there in the traditions of man, and we've got to come out of that. And we have to understand it, and we have to take a stand against it, and we have to do our best to alert our brethren about those false traditions so they will wake up, and they'll start seeing the light, and they will also want to come out of that deception. Again, we're talking about the false traditions of men. The true gospel is not of secularism. You've got to let that sink in. Well, if the true gospel is not of secularism, then why are we having any of that secularism, that gospel of secularism, being introduced into the church? Why are we aligning ourselves with Judeo-Christianity? Why are, why are Christians quote, Christians, embracing Judeo-Christianity. What is there about Judeo-Christianity that is so inviting and so wonderful and is setting them free? Is Judeo-Christianity setting people free today? Has it been doing that for the last 200 years in our nation? We've got to ask the hard questions, and we've got to face reality. And that's why this is called the reality a foundation reality. What type of foundation are we on? What church are you a part of? Are you a part of denominationalism? The mixing of secularism? The mixing of politics? The politics of man? The, the mixing of Talmudic thought? And really, to a large degree, that's the very problem, that they do not understand what Talmudic thought is and where it came from. The very people that Judeo-Christianity worships and praises, the Jews, the Edomite, Red Edomite kingdom, the Red Edomites that are the descendants of Esau, that have been warring against Jacob Israel all these centuries and that are a major part of what Mystery Babylon is all about. That's the real problem that we are facing today, and we've got to understand that, and we've got to come out of that, and we've got to quit worshiping these false Jews. And really, I'm using the word worship because that's what they're doing. Because Judeo-Christianity cannot function without worshiping and praising the Jews. And we have to ask ourselves again, are they really God's chosen people? Are the Jews who make up, is that who makes up the whole house of Israel? Do Do they even make up the southern kingdom of Judah? Are they what represents the southern kingdom of Judah? Now you have the um, worldwide, worldwide Church of God, and you have Mormons to a certain degree, although this new generation of Mormons wouldn't understand that. But once upon a time, Mormonism, although they got many things wrong, and I'm not getting into all their false doctrine, but I want to talk, touch on this, They did at one time believe that they were a part of the lost ten tribes of Israel. But they also believed that the Jews were of the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, what's the difference now between that and what the Baptists are saying and the Protestantism or the Catholic Church is saying? What do they say? Well, they say the Jews are God's chosen people. And the rest of the world out there, the Gentile world out there, that's what the gospel is all about. It's to the Jews, and now, because of Christ, it's unto the Gentiles. And that's why 
they worship, and they have made sacred a false form of salvation. We need to open our church, they say, to all people, all races, because now the gospel is unto the Gentiles. And that's in part what I want to talk to you again about today, because we do have to get the right understanding. We need to understand what the Bible says, not what I say, not what I think, not what you say, and not what you think, not what other churches may say or think, but we want to know what thus saith the Lord and His Word. Do we not? Can I get an amen? Thank you. So the real gospel is in the biblical Jesus and his church. Think about it. It's the real gospel is in the biblical Jesus and his true church. Let's go on to 1 Corinthians now, chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Quote, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now I wonder, it's quite important, who are ye? Who's being addressed in these, this question here? Israelites. I mean, there's so many ways of proving that, but you've got to understand right away who is being addressed here. And it's Israel. And he's telling Israel, the house of Israel, that Ye are the temple of God. Why? Why did God choose, you know, we go back to Adam, and then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, uh, and bringing Israel and, uh, uh, out of Egypt, the Egyptian bondage, making a covenant with them. Of course, God Almighty had already made a covenant with the seed of Abraham, right? Genesis 17, Genesis 12. Go back there and read those chapters on the covenants that God Almighty established. These are the promises of God that He didn't make with the world. And that's, well, that, that's insensitive. You know, we, we need, do you want to be sensitive to the secularism? Do you want to be sensitive to what the world thinks and how the world feels? Is that what you think should be sacred that we should worship how the world thinks and how the world feels or how we might feel. No, we want to be, what is sacred is what thus saith the Lord. And we've got to read His Word. And we've got to have the right understanding concerning His covenants and promises. And that's what the Scriptures are all about. So, ye Israel are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Hmm. Does the Spirit of God dwell in Israel? I get a yes on it. Thank you. The Spirit of God is within Israel. There's something unique about the, the, uh, the, uh, well, the nature, the character, uh, All that Israel is a part of and embodied in Israel is different. If I'm reading the Word of God correctly, that's what it's telling me here. Now, there's more to it than what meets the eye. Because I'm not just saying that we, in and of ourselves, are somehow God's. And we, are, we don't need God Almighty, we don't need King Jesus, we don't need His Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you, there is a spirit within His people. And we need to understand that. And that spirit can grow. That spirit can increase. There is a seed that is there that needs spiritual awakening, may I say. Does that make sense to you? If any man, verse 17, defile the temple of God. Well, 
Why would it say if any man defiled the temple of God? What's so important about that? If we are not the temple of God, what's the big deal about defiling the temple of God? Because there's that seed, and if you're not careful with that seed, you're going to corrupt that seed, that spiritual seed. It won't grow. You'll have false foundations. It'll be filled, filled with false foundations. Is not man walking on false foundations today in many different ways? Believing in the false foundations, you name it. You know, from the law, what law are they following today? What law are they believing? What government are they walking in? What understanding do they have of government? Is it the government of God, the kingdom of God, God's principles? Is that the higher authority that they have, or is it, well, no, pastor, it's the Constitution. No, pastor, it's, it's what's happening in Washington, D.C. That evil pit? Are we to have faith in that? My God, if anything in the last 250 years it show, it should have shown man is that we cannot put our faith in the institutes of man, but in God Almighty and His kingdom. I'm telling you some serious stuff here. we got to rethink what government we are to be serving, what government we are to obey. What is the higher authority? If it isn't Jesus Christ, who is it? I like President Trump, but he's not my higher authority. I think God called him. God wants him to be a Cyrus. He's shaking things up. He's doing a pretty good job. He's doing better than any president I've known. But I'll tell you what, I don't worship him. And I certainly don't worship Congress, and I don't worship the judicial branch in any of their higher or lower co courts. I don't worship them at all. I don't believe in their jurisdiction. I don't believe in their laws. I don't worship their laws. I don't walk according to their laws. What laws should we, we, what should we be walking according to? God's laws. God's commandments. So, go in the way of the world, seeking the ways of this world, is defiling the temple. Didn't we just get through reading that, reading that verse 17? If any man defile the temple of God, goes on to say, Him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Hmm. Should there be something about it that we should... Uh, hold sacred, that there's something there within God's creation with Adamic Israel that we should hold sacred and honor and do our best to properly fill it with the right laws, the right jurisdiction, the right principles that come from God's Word, the authority, the real authority that comes from God's Word, the real jurisdiction. Should we not be building the right type of offices that are declared in God's Word and have those offices and be over those uh, proper biblical leadership. And you say, well, you're, you're, that's a mouthful, Pastor. That can never be done. Uh, we can never have that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's too much for me. What, you don't have any faith in God? You don't believe God means what He says in His Word? What He declares in His Word? Now, I'm not saying perfection's going to come out of man. Perfection will come out of God, though. Don't you believe God can perfect His creation and set it in proper biblical order? And it's out of His order today. It's going according to the ways and means of Babylon. And too many... Too much of what we see today is being directed by Babylonian thought and thinking. If your foundation is not built upon Christ, the solid rock, it's a false foundation. And that false foundation is going to be destroyed. We just read that from the scriptures. 
people fill because they have false foundations. The true temple of God will not contain idols. I saw a lady the other day, uh, the other day when I went to the post office. She got out of her car. She must have been in her 40s. And she had a very nice car. And she was dressed, you know, rather expensively, may I say. And you know what? Half of her body was tattooed. Half of her body was tattooed. And she had a short haircut. Looked like a man almost. And she pranced out of that car thinking she was really it and was really something else. She's, her body, body has become an idol. She's an idolatrous woman. And people may disagree with me, but she's nothing but a whore. She's a part of whoredoms, the whoredoms of Mystery Babylon. Her mind has been seduced. No false foundations of man. We've got to get away from the false foundations of man. Again, if you're looking for, you know, a quick answer, no. It's staying upon God's Word. It's precept upon precept, believing God's Word, upholding God's Word, standing upon God's Word. That means no paganism. No mingling with the heathen. No indulging in the things of the flesh. Like lying, fornication, uncleanness, adultery, sedition. And by the way, and this is, comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. When it's talking about sedition, it's not talking about against the, the uh, false foundations and kingdoms of, and governments of man. It's talking about the kingdom of God. Warring against the kingdom of God. We are to stand upon the revelation, therefore. The Re How about the book of Revelation, which is Jesus Christ? It starts out telling us right there. That's that foundation. The re revelation that comes from God's word. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about the church. Quote, I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. Isn't that powerful? Let me give you another one. I like that one. i got to give you another one. Charles Spurgeon said this also, that that very church which the world likes best, is sure to be that which God abhors. Hmm. And, and look at all these popular churches out there. Need I say more on that? So therefore, we've got to do, again, this word I will throw out, I spiritual paradigm shift or a biblical paradigm shift means getting in right standing with the true word of God, believing God's word, not man's thoughts, not man's denominationalism, not man's denominational books of, of worship, but God's word. That's the true word of worship we are to follow and obey. And we are to honor and respect, therefore, the true biblical church. Denominationalism has corrupted the church. Has it not? It's corrupted the church. Denominationalism has polluted the church by mixing and mingling the true biblical church of Israel. Denominationalism has wrongly taught who the Gentiles of the Scriptures are. The church has been corrupted and mingled with Gentiles who are not of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And we'll be reading in these verses for a while here. Quote, For we, now the Apostle Paul is speaking unto, again, the twelve tribes of Israel. For we, are Israel, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye, who's ye again? The subject matter is Israel, speaking unto the Adamic Israelites, being in time past Gentiles, meaning in times past they were Gentiles, meaning God Almighty divorced the northern house of Israel, and they, the northern ten tribe, northern house of Israel, became no longer his people. They became, they no longer had the status of Israel after God divorced them. Does anybody not understand that? Well, apparently there's a heck of a lot of Judeo-Christians who don't understand that because they argue and miss that point and skip over that point and don't even really have any, have any concept of what that pure truth from God's Word is concerning what we're reading here. And we've got to get on the right biblical track again. We've got to have the right understanding. That's why I'm taking the time to go over these things with you in this message. So if we don't understand that he's talking to Israel, we're going to miss that. We are his workmanship. He's not talking about the, uh, the, all the various races of the world here. Verse 12, 11. Wherefore remember that ye, ye Israelites, being in past times Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision. The divorced northern house of Israel were called uncircumcised. They became paganized. They became Gentilized. They became as the heathen. And they were scattered among the nations by that which is called the circumcision. Well, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, the true Judeans, part of Benjaminite and uh, Levite, and there were scattering of other of the tribes there, they were not divorced, they were the circumcision still. And they called them the divorced northern house of Israel who were put away because of their idolatrous paganized way. They went into the flesh. And the Bible warns us about the things of the flesh. I just read to you. Read them over in Galatians. And um, they became corrupted. Again, there's two parties here. The northern uh, divorce house of Israel, they were known as now the Gentiles, the dispersed, gentilized house of Israel. And then there was the other kingdom, the second kingdom, the uh, a southern kingdom of Judah. The northern house became as the uncircumcised. The southern kingdom of Judah, which was not divorced, were known as the circumcised. Now, where do you get in all of this, may I ask, please, that about salvation, and this is, Pastor, this is unto the Jews and unto all the other races, the Gentiles. Can you see the corruption of the true gospel that is being preached out there by denominationalism, by Judeo-Christianity, and people want to know to, from me today, well, should I go to the Judeo-Christian church? If I told you before, it's okay. Excuse me, but I was wrong. I deceived you unknowingly, but you need to come out of that. You need to come out of that. Well, what can I do, Pastor? You can stay home and read God's Word. You'll be a heck of a lot better off if you have no preaching at all from me or anybody else, and you just open God's Word, and you read it, and you trust it, and you obey it, than you will ever go into a Judeo-Christian church. So the northern house of Israel became again. And I'm going to reiterate this as I go through here because we need to get this down pat. The northern house of Israel became gentilized. God Almighty divorced them and they lost their marriage covenant status. 
because of their idolatry again. God divorced them, and they became as the uncircumcised. Moving on to verse 12 now. That at that time, ye, who? Ye, Israel, were without Christ. And who's Christ? The foundation rock. Again, because God Almighty, we're talking about God's divorcement of the northern house of Israel. They became what? It says, being aliens, these Israelites, these divorced Israelites, became aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, where they were a part of it at one time. Now they're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And strangers, now from the covenant of promise. Having no hope and without God in their in the world. They had no hope because God divorced them. You were Israelites, but you became what well, you want to be like the other nations. You want to go out there like them. You you embraced paganism. You became an idolatrous people. And the Bible also, I want to use that term again, calls you now a nation of whores or of whoredom. You sold your soul to this idolatrous paganiz- paganization. And as divorced Israelites, they were without Christ. That's what Paul is telling us here. They were without salvation. May I use that term? Yes, I dare. That's what it means here. And, and, the subject, and God's addressing this to who? To Israel again. You were without salvation. They became aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. At one time, they were of the commonwealth of Israel. But since God divorced them, they became as aliens and strangers, it says, to the covenants and promises. How do you get this false Judeo-Christian gobbledygook uh, doctrine of universalism out of any of these verses. How do you get it? Only by corrupting God's word and lying about God's word. Let's not kid ourselves. Falsifying what the scriptures are saying, that's the only way. But Jesus came as Israel's redeemer. They were in need of salvation. They were in need of redemption. He came as their Redeemer and Savior to restore them back to their former status through the new covenant. He is bringing lost Israel back unto the covenant. Denominationalism has again corrupted the gospel. We have got to understand that. And I don't think, and I'm stressing this because, again, I don't think a lot of people really get it. And I've come to find out that a lot of people that I thought knew the truth of the gospel and people that you could rely upon, they were going to be stalwart Christian people, they're not. Now, I'm not calling everybody that away, but I'm saying if the shoe fits, Israelites wear it. I remember a man. And if he hears this message, I'm sorry if he's offended by that. But doggone it, it really upsets me. And it's not about me, but it offends my God. He came to this conference the last time we had a conference. I've seen him at other conferences. I've shook his hand, had dinner with him. A number of years, I'm not using his name, but I'll tell you right now. A number of years ago, he divorced his wife in, in uh, Oregon, and I was really sad to hear about that. And, you know, I thought, well, I don't know, maybe he had biblical grounds for divorcing his wife. And then I don't hear from him for quite a while, and all of a sudden he shows up at the conference here. Larry, you would know him if I brought his name up. And now all of a sudden I'm told he's moving about three hours away from us in the Colville, Washington area, and he has married an Asian woman. Married an Asian woman. How can you do that? He, he, he knows the truth, folks. He knows what God's Word says about corrupting ourselves and mixing ourselves and mingling in ourselves and all these things which were told to do as Israelites, 
It's, it's like uh, you were, and I were talking earlier, uh, uh, another gentleman here, about uh, people that, you know, oh, you know, I, you know so what, you know, uh, I, uh, God's Word says this about pork and shellfish and stuff like that, but I just love the way it tastes. And so I'm going to continue eating it. Well, you know, I'm not saying you're going to get to hell, but you may get there a whole lot quicker by eating things like that. But I don't care. You know, God's Word says we shouldn't do those things. Let's obey God. What's so hard about that? He's not depriving you of a steak or chicken or there's clean fish to eat. He's saying stay away from these. Do you love me enough and do you have enough faith in me and my word that you will obey me? Oh, but, you know, I've heard this from people. Oh, but pastor, you know, I know it's wrong, but, you know, these Asians, you know, they, they're good cooks and, they, and, you know, and, 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 you know, they fulfill a need that I have. What need is that, I wonder? You know, I, I guarantee you a lot of people are going to get offensive, uh, offended by what I've said. They're going to write me and say, Pastor, take me off your mailing list. Well, you know what? I'll be glad to do that. If you hate my God so much that you want to go your own carnal, materialistic way, then you just go that way. I'll stick with God Almighty and His Word. But what are these people doing? They are corrupting the true church of Israel. This man that I was talking about, that went off and now is married to this Asian woman. What is he doing? He's corrupting the temple. He's corrupting the church of Israel, the body of Christ. He said, well, our body's the temple of God, and it's not that church out there. You Come on, get that in proper biblical context when you have... Lots of God's uh, people assembling together. That's the church. They're forming the church. And it's the church of Israel, by the way, not the church of the world. Not the church of all non-Israelites, all of us coming together and intermingling and mixing and, and bringing your ways and your culture. And, and that's, not what, that's not God's church. That's a corruption of God's church. The gospel is not about universal salvation. It's not about universal salvation for all people. It's about the restoration of Israel unto the kingdom. Don't you remember God bringing his people out of Egypt, Israelites? And we're not supposed to forget that. We're supposed to tell it to our children. And where did he bring them? Into the kingdom. But they didn't have faith. Right away, there was a problem. They had their, the ways of Egyptians still in them, and God had to drive it out. And they kept desiring to be like the other nations. Do you desire to be like the other nations? Yeah. You want to be like Mexico? Go to Mexico. You want to be like China? Go to China. You want to be like dark Africa? Go to dark Africa. And sad to say, many white nations today that were white nations are becoming like that. They're embracing the ways of the heathen. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off or made nigh by the blood of Christ, divorce Israel, they were spiritually and, and, and physically far off, we could say. In reality, they, the divorce, uh, they, in actuality, divorced themselves from God Almighty, we could say. They went into paganism and became idolatrous. They became a nation of of whores or in whoredom. Verse 19. For he is our peace, meaning Jesus is our restorer. Verse 14. Oh, did I say 19? Sorry, I meant 19, uh, 14. For he is our peace, again, meaning, uh, am I wrong on that? Okay, I'm going to have to sit down and slap myself a few times. Okay, I'm right. Okay, thank you. Meaning Jesus is our restorer. He is our healer, our redeemer. And it says that he is our peace, meaning he is our peacemaker. He'll make peace. 
yeah, but the enemy out there, they're all really big. You know, the Chinese, look at what they're doing. They're building up their military. Look at Russia. They're building up their military. Look at, uh, I don't care, North Korea, whoever out there. Look at all the enemy coming across the border from Mexico. Look at this. Look at that. What? Where's your faith? Oh, you know, you sound like uh, those Israelites who had so little faith when they went to the kingdom. Oh, there's giants in the land. We can't take, we can't, uh, take the kingdom. And Joshua and Caleb, the two we remember, said, we're more than able to. Well, our God's more than able to protect us. You know, really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a loaded subject because when we're living as an idolatrous way in a, in a paganized way like we are today, and we're really in the epitome of mystery Babylon, uh, we need a military. But do we really? You know, uh, it, it's like, um, God, you're Jesus, King Jesus, you are our peacemaker. But no, you're not our peacemaker because we're not able to obey you. We're not able to follow you. And so because we're so bad, because we're so idolatrous, we need a big standing arm. We need to spend a trillion dollars on our military. And that'll save us. Do you really think that? that you can somehow bypass God Almighty with your trillion dollars or whatever and build up a great military and save yourselves? I'll tell you what, when the hand of God is coming against you, there isn't any amount of money that's going to save you, Israel. So it goes on to say that he is our peacemaker who hath made both one. Interesting wording. Who hath made both? Who's both? Israel. It's talking about the diverse northern house of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. He's made them now both one. Meaning, Jesus made both one under the new covenant. Under the new covenant. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, interesting wording, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. And there are, you know, these uh, grace people only. See, the law's been done away. It says it right there. The law's been done away with. Oh, really? I don't think so. In fact, I know that is a lie. And that's one of the lies of Judeo-Christianity. It says, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. That's interesting. That, it's important to understand. That wording used there, contained in the ordinances. For to make of himself a twain of twain, one you man, so making peace. What? He's going to make these two sticks of Israel that were divided one. Okay, but let's go to this law aspect, and let's cover that real quick. Really, what these verses are telling us here, and the Apostle Paul is telling us, is that the law has limited power. Jesus Christ has unlimited power. The law had only a very limited power. The law could not save or restore Israel, could it? Or we would have been saved and restored. It would, re would require what? It would require a kinsman redeemer. Guess what? King Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Can I get an amen? Now this verse says, again, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. And I have to ask, what does this mean? Does it mean that we are to throw out the Ten Commandments of God, for example? People only recognize the Ten Commandments. Well, if you only recognize the Ten Commandments, does this verse mean, if you're grace only, that we can throw out the commandments of God? Are we now free to do whatever we want to do in life? Thus making what Jesus accomplished upon the cross to redeem Israel a farce? In other words, in the New Covenant, which is 
told in Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 10. If you don't know what that is, go read them. Didn't Jesus say that he was going to write his laws upon or within Israel's heart? Is this abolishing the law if he's going to write his laws upon our heart? Or is it upholding God's law? This verse is saying, again, the law of those commandments, the law of those, I'm inserting the word here, those commandments. That's what we have to understand here, what it's talking about are contained in ordinances. Many of those ordinances contained in the blood rituals and blood sacrifices which could not save or redeem Israel. Only Jesus, his sinless blood, could save and redeem. Save and redeem whom, again? To save and redeem Israel. That's the very subject matter. And they're the people who are called under the divine covenant. Israel, the people who were, again, Let's say deemed are the people who will be redeemed. You can't redeem a people who were not deemed in the first place. Let's move on to Ephesians 2, verse 16. Ephesians 2, verse 16. And that ye might, and excuse me, that he might, Jesus might reconcile both. Lord, it's talking about Israel again and what happened to Israel, the status of Israel. And they became divorced, and God's going to bring them back. He, 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 like I read to you last week, Ezekiel 37. Read that chapter. Where does it mean both? Or what does it mean? Again, Israel, the houses of Israel. Unto God in one body. Notice unto God one body. Israel, divorced, again, who became Gentilized. They're no longer separated. That's what the scriptures are telling us. They're no longer separated as they were. This verse goes on to say, how? By the cross, having slain the enmity. This enmity that kept us separate and divided, thereby it says. Meaning, those powerless animal sacrifices, those ordinances of the animal sacrifices, those powerless ordinances that could not save or redeem. Verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which were far off, again, meaning the divorced and scattered northern house of Israel who were scattered among the nations. God scattered them when he divorced them and put them away, scattered them among the nations, and they really lost in many ways their identity. And unto them that were nigh. Well, who are them that are nigh? Are, are nigh? Meaning the Judeans of the southern kingdom of Judah. You see, if you understand Bible terminology and you get it in its proper context, it answers itself. Verse 18. For through him, meaning through Jesus, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye, ye formerly divorced and put away tribes of the northern house of Israel, are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. How's he doing this? How's he bringing them back in the church? For one thing, the household of God. And Christ is to be the chief cornerstone of the church, most certainly. And are built upon this church, verse 20, are built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. They've all paid the price. They established the truth concerning and the principles that which the church are to be led and guided by. Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, the foundation for all that we are to do. Verse 21, in whom 
all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye, meaning Israel again, also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. I'm getting ready to close here, but I want to say these things in closing. And I have another verse to add. This is one of the main functions and and purposes of the Holy Spirit in all that we're reading here. To bring Israel together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That Holy Spirit is going to ignite the hearts of His people. And, And that Holy Spirit is to grow within His people. To become the true Church of God. The covenant saints of God. Led and directed by the Holy Spirit. Physical Israel, we could say becoming spiritual or Holy Spirit directed. This is the great transforming work of Christ upon the cross. Transforming fleshly Israel into spiritual saints in His church, meaning His body. In closing, I like Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 11. I'll read real quick for you. Isaiah 52 and verse 11. It says, Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. And we could say, this is like that verse saying, Come out of Babylon, be ye not partakers of her sins. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. The Judeo-Christian church would stress our only purpose is to get people saved. Salvation, you say? Israelites, according to the word of God, dear saints, are the recipients of true biblical salvation. The gospel was sent unto Adamic Israel. Divorce Israel became the Gentiles in need of restoration, as we have said over and over in this message. And the Apostle Paul clearly expresses. True biblical salvation is not a co- to a congregation of all races into some church building as Judeo-Christianity or denominationalism has it today. The assembly is to be the Adamic Israelites. Universalism is not biblical. Universalism is not biblical. Now we have to get this straight. If universalism If the gospel of salvation as is taught in denominationalism and Judeo-Christianity is correct, then folks, they're reading out of a different Bible. And I guarantee you, there has been a corruption and a deception that has been tolerated and allowed in I will call the false churches for a long, long time. Hundreds of years, probably thousands of years. From the very beginning, the universal church, the Catholic church, has been a part of what? Well, you know, they've been mainly prosecuting and persecuting the church, were they not? I mean, that's what the Dark Ages were really all about. And, of course, they were responsible mainly for keeping the Word of God and the truth and the light from God's people. And you know what? That is still going on today. Still going on today. I was shown a picture of the uh, um, one of the Pope's uh, assembly, huge assembly rooms, that is a part of, uh, you know, it's just, it's just outside of the uh, Vatican, and it's also connected with the Vatican, and a part of the Vatican. And you know what it is? 
when you're looking at it and you come on the doors, you see this snake, this vision of this snake. And all along the uh, um, roof of it are uh, the, uh, the scales. And everywhere you look in this room, you see uh, these images of the snake. And really, stop and think about it. Why would the Pope embrace and be a part of anything like that? Why would the church and his minions and his, his secret group and secret society assemble in that horrid hall, this snake pit, unless they were a part of a snake doctrine and deception? Well, i got to close. we got to wake up, folks. We can't play games anymore. We need to be about our Heavenly Father's business. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come to you now and pray for this message. We pray for the truth to be known to your people and that they will wake up, that they will have formed spiritual backbone in them, that they will wake up and they will want to help us and they will want to help the gospel, true gospel message go forth and they will want to come out of Babylon and not be partakers of their sins the secularized false gospel. And they will we want to be a part of serving you. And they will want to persevere and support and be a part of the true gospel kingdom message. Amen is our prayer. <coughs> what about the scripture where it says, <coughs> you can have the foreigners amongst you, but they must believe in me. <laughs> Uh, you'd, I, I'd have to look at that. Larry, you know what verse she's talking about? The, you can have the foreigners among you. Okay, well, you can have